Your body makes and uses billions of ATP molecules every second. How? That's what Unit 3 Cellular Energetics is all about. Photosynthesis, respiration, enzymes, and the energy that fuels life. Hey, I'm Melanie King from The Absolute Recap, and I make AP Bio easier with podcasts, study guides, videos, the ultimate review packet, and the ultimate exam slayer. Welcome to the updated Unit 3 review for Cellular Energetics, aligned with the AP Biology course and exam description released by the College Board for Fall 2025. But this isn't just about getting ready for your next quiz. Think of it as your go-to review for your midterm, your final, and of course, the AP Bio exam in May. Before we jump in, don't forget to grab your free copy of the AP Bio Ultimate Review Packet. The link's in the description. It's packed with everything you need, a video aligned study guide with an answer key, multiple choice practice, skill building worksheets and walkthroughs with links to even more videos and podcasts to help you study smarter. Not currently taking AP Bio? No worries. These resources were great for any high school or college level biology course too. And if you're just here for a quick focused review, check out the Ultimate Exam Slayer. It's 100% designed for exam prep. You'll get unit tests, full length practice exams, one pagers for every unit, math and graphing review sheets, plus exclusive tip videos to help you crush the exam in May. Okay, let's zoom in. 3.1 Enzymes Biological systems need energy and building blocks to grow, reproduce, and keep everything in balance. That's what we call dynamic homeostasis. But here's the problem. Most of the chemical reactions that make life possible happen way too slowly on their own. That's where enzymes come in. Enzymes are proteins that act like tiny biological catalysts. Their job, beat up reactions by lowering the activation energy. Think of it like reducing the height of a hill so a ball can roll over it with more ease. Without enzymes, your cells wouldn't be able to function fast enough to keep you alive. Now, enzymes are picky. For a reaction to happen, the shape and charge of the substrate, that's the molecule the enzyme works on, has to fit perfectly into the enzyme's active site. It's kind of like plugging in the right charger into your phone. If the shape doesn't match, the reaction just won't happen. This whole interaction is explained by the enzyme substrate complex model, where the enzyme and substrate bind together, do their job, and then separate so the enzyme can be reused again and again. That's how your cells keep all their reactions efficient and under control. 3.2 Environmental Impacts on Enzyme Function Enzymes are like tiny biological machines made of protein. But just like machines in real life, if you mess with their structure, they stop working the way they should. Changes in temperature, pH, or the chemical environment can disrupt the hydrogen bonds holding an enzyme shape together. When that happens, the enzyme denatures. Basically, it unravels and loses the ability to catalyze reactions. Enzymes usually work best within a specific range of conditions Conditions. They're sweet spot. For example, the enzymes in your stomach, like pepsin, love acidic conditions, while enzymes in your small intestine prefer a more neutral pH. Go outside of those ranges and efficiency drops fast. Sometimes denaturation can even be reversed if the conditions return to normal, but other times the damage is permanent. Think of it like cooking an egg. Once the proteins in the egg white are denatured by heat, you can't unscramble it back into a liquid state. The cellular environment also affects enzyme activity in other ways. The amount of substrate available matters. If there's not enough, reactions slow down. Temperature can speed things up too, since warmer molecules collide more often, but only up to a point. Push past that optimal temperature and the enzyme structure breaks down again. And then there are inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors block the active site so the real substrate can't bind. Non-competitive inhibitors, on the other hand, bind somewhere else on the enzyme, changing its shape so it doesn't work properly. The bottom line, enzymes are powerful, but picky. They need the right shape and the right environment to help cells do their work efficiently. 3.3 Cellular Energy Life runs on energy. Every living system from bacteria to blue whales needs a constant input of energy to stay alive. Without it, things fall apart, literally. That's basically the second law of thermodynamics at work. Energy naturally spreads out unless organisms actively bring it back together. To keep order, cells have to make sure energy inputs exceed energy loss. 
Some processes, like breaking down glucose and cellular respiration, release energy. Others, like building DNA or contracting a muscle, require energy. And cells are clever. They couple these processes together, like using the energy from a downhill bike ride to power yourself up the next hill. If energy flow stops, order is lost, and the result is death. That's why energy isn't just helpful, it's essential. Cells also manage energy through careful, controlled pathways. And these aren't just random, they're step-by-step -step processes, like a factory assembly line, where the product of one step becomes a starting material for the next. Core pathways, like glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, are so effective that they've been conserved across all forms of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. In other words, whether you're a microbe or a human, we're all running on variations of the same ancient energy systems. 3.4 Photosynthesis Photosynthesis is the process where light energy is converted into chemical energy. We're building something, that's the synthesis, using light, that's the photo. Plants, algae, and some bacteria capture carbon dioxide, water, and light energy to make sugar and release oxygen as a byproduct. This process first evolved in ancient prokaryotes, like cyanobacteria, which pumped out enough oxygen to change Earth's atmosphere forever, setting the stage for complex life to evolve. Later, eukaryotes borrowed the same tricks when chloroplasts became part of their cells through endosymbiosis. The first stage of photosynthesis is the light reaction, which takes place in the thylakoid membrane. Those flat thylakoid membranes increase surface area to volume ratio, which helps ions accumulate quickly, making the process more efficient. Large protein complexes called photosystems are filled with pigment molecules like chlorophyll to capture light energy. When sunlight hits chlorophyll, water is is split into hydrogen ions and oxygen, and electrons get excited. Those electrons travel through an electron transport chain, starting at photosystem two and moving to photosystem one, losing energy along the way. That lost electron energy helps pump protons into the thylakoid space, creating an electrochemical gradient of hydrogen ions. As protons flow back into the stroma through ATP synthase, ATP is formed, a process called chemiosmosis. Because light drives this ATP production, we call it photophosphorylation. Meanwhile, the electrons re-energize at photosystem one, reduce NADP plus into NADPH. By the end of the light reaction, we've produced ATP, NADPH, and oxygen. The Calvin cycle takes place in the stroma and uses CO2 to build carbohydrates, powered by ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. It has three phases, fixation, reduction, and regeneration. During fixation, CO2 attaches to a five carbon molecule, RUBP, to form a short-lived six carbon intermediate that splits into two three carbon molecules. In reduction, those three carbon molecules are rearranged into G3P using energy from ATP and electrons from NADPH. Lastly, regeneration. Some G3P exits the cycle to form sugars, while the rest regenerates the original five carbon molecule so the cycle can continue. The G3P made here can go on to form glucose or other biological molecules through dehydration synthesis. So in short, light reactions capture energy, build ATP and NADPH, and release oxygen. Then the Calvin cycle caches in that energy to build sugars that fuel life. Photosynthesis is how the planet converts sunlight into food and energy, literally powering the biosphere. 3.5 Cellular Respiration Cellular respiration is how cells take the energy stored in food and exchange it for ATP, the cell's spendable energy currency. Every organism on Earth, from bacteria to humans, uses some version of this process. In eukaryotes, aerobic respiration runs on a carefully coordinated series of enzyme-driven reactions. It's catabolic and exergonic, meaning energy is released as glucose and oxygen are converted into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. Cellular respiration happens in four stages, glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. The first three steps oxidize glucose completely, transferring high energy electrons to coenzymes, NADH and FADH2. Some ATP is made directly through substrate level phosphorylation, but most ATP comes later through oxidative phosphorylation, powered by chemiosmosis in the mitochondria. Glycolysis happens in the cytosol, where one, six carbon glucose molecule is split into two three carbon pyruvates. 
It requires an input of 2 ATP, but produces 4 ATP and NADH for later stages. If oxygen isn't available, cells switch to fermentation, which regenerates NAD+, so glycolysis can continue. Fermentation produces a carbon byproduct, often alcohol and yeast, or lactic acid in animals. When oxygen is present, pyruvate enters the mitochondrial matrix, where it's converted into acetyl-CoA and releases CO2. This step prepares the carbon skeleton for the Krebs cycle. Inside the matrix, acetyl-CoA joins a four-carbon molecule to form citric acid, which is gradually broken down in a series of enzyme-driven steps. Each turn of the cycle releases carbon dioxide, generates a small amount of ATP, and produces multiple NADH and FADH2 molecules loaded with high-energy electrons for the final stage. The ETC takes place along the inner mitochondrial membrane, where cristae provide a large surface area packed with embedded proteins. Prokaryotes don't have mitochondria, so they they use their plasma membrane instead. Same principle, different location. Electrons from NADH and FADH2 are transferred through these proteins, and their energy is used to pump hydrogens from the matrix into the intramembrane space. This builds up an electrochemical gradient, potential energy just waiting to be released. As the protons flow back into the matrix through ATP synthase, ATP is generated in a process called chemiosmosis. Under ideal conditions, this produces around 30 ATP per glucose molecule through oxidative phosphorylation. Finally, oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor, combining with hydrogen ions and electrons to form water at the end of the chain. Some prokaryotes can swap oxygen out for a different final acceptor, but the idea is the same. The ATP produced powers nearly all cellular work, from active transport to muscle contraction to nerve impulses. Some of the carbon skeletons from intermediate steps are recycled into biosynthetic pathways, forming lipids, amino acids, and other essential molecules. And not all energy becomes ATP. Roughly 60% is lost as heat. For endothermic organisms like birds and mammals, that heat is put to good use, helping maintain body temperature and homeostasis. In short, glycolysis breaks down glucose. The Krebs cycle releases more electrons and CO2. The ETC and chemiosmosis crank out ATP, and fermentation provides a backup when oxygen's not around. To recap, energy in, energy out. It's biology's ultimate balancing act. Cells rely on enzymes to catalyze reactions and regulate metabolism. Each enzyme is specific to its substrate, and temperature and pH can affect how they work. Photosynthesis turns sunlight into chemical energy in the chloroplast. The light-dependent reactions produce ATP and NADPH, while the Calvin cycle makes sugars. In respiration, glucose is broken down in glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Mitochondria use oxygen to make a ton of ATP. Without oxygen, fermentation steps in, but it's much less efficient. ATP is the energy currency of the cell, fueling everything from muscle contraction to molecule synthesis. Need more support? Check out all the available resources for you in the Ultimate Review Packet and the Ultimate Exam Slayer. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next recap for Unit 4, Cell Communication and Cell Cycle.